Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, May 10th, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So, thank you. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously current market conditions and things are improving, but I'm not sure we're out of the woods just yet. We'll get to that in just one second. Your questions on, oh, video not showing, huh? All right. Thank you. Trying to get, yeah, we had a snafu last week, and thank you for that. Hello, friend. Okay, so what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, and market is improving. But there's a few little caveats out there, and let's just let's let's start kissing each other just yet. I think is the theme. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides while we're on the slides. But you can ask about anything you want. Also, your favorite stock picks, and for your benefit, wait until we get to the live charts. That way, I'll, they won't get buried in the other questions. And also, ask about one ticker at a time. Also, for your benefit, that way I'll know which ones I covered and which ones I did not. So you can ask about as many as you want, just ask about a ticker and then hit return. So what do we talk about? Well, your checklist for trading. Now this might look familiar. This is take two. Last week I forgot to hit record. They put this new automatic record feature in. I kind of didn't like it and just the change of my routine kind of screwed me up. Anyway, so for those of you who were here last week, uh, if you want to go get a cup of coffee, that's fine. But if you want to hear me uh, go through it again, that would be awesome, too. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as often sum it up, barring a line from Greg Morris, who we're going to talk about a lot today. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. Let's talk about your checklist for successful traders. About a year and a half ago, I was at Traders Expo, and Greg Morris flew in to, he wasn't on his plane, he flew in to meet the gang up there for his 69th birthday. He figured it'd be hard to get everybody to his house in Georgia, but it'd be easy to just fly up and just meet up with everyone. And we were having dinner, and usually during dinner or after dinner when we have the cocktails, or before dinner when we have the cocktails, we, the conversation turns to trading or aviation and sometimes both because Greg, in addition to running over $5 billion, was an F-4 pilot and then later a commercial airline pilot. So I asked Greg, I said, Greg, is everything on the pilot's checklist there because someone actually forgot to do it? He says, exactly. And I said, including the landing gear? And he goes, yes, of course. Now, this gentleman here was very heroic. He did land this plane safely, so it was not his fault. It was a landing gear did not come down in his defense. So this got me thinking about your pre-trade checklist, your doing trade checklist, and your after-trade checklist. So let's talk about your pre-trade checklist. Now, when you're treasure hunting, you want to make sure you pick the best and lead the rest. I know that's cliche. That needs to be done after hours. When information is changing or uncertain, that's when your stress begins to go up. So you can't wing it. You have to put the time in and plan your trade. The argument or the discussion, I should say, of stress being its highest when information is changing or uncertain comes from Gary Klein. And originally I found that in a book by Montier. So the first question you need to ask yourself, and again, you want to pick the best and leave the rest. The first question you want to ask yourself is,
does the stock trade cleanly and not like an electrocardiogram? If you notice on the right, I have an electrocardiogram, and I preach this week in and week out, but if you come to the, the weekend charts chart show, you'll notice that many times people who should know better ask about stocks that look like an electrocardiogram. In other words, they're just bouncing all over the place and not trading cleanly. On the left, we have an example of a stock that trades cleanly. Yes, it did consolidate, but going sideways, and that was in a longer term uptrend. That's okay. Notice that when it did trend higher, it continued, for the most part, to persist higher, meaning that it went higher day after day after day after day. I have complete patterns built on this, such as, for instance, persistent pullbacks, where we're looking for the stock to have persistency and tread. In other words, it tends to go up day after day. Mathematically, as I preach, this is equivalent to linear regression, but I just like to draw a bar through as many lines as, I'm sorry, mathematically this equates to linear regression, but I just like to draw a trend line through as many bars as possible to intersect as many as possible. Now, if we look off to the right, and somebody actually sent me this trade, or potential trade, and I wasn't sure whether they wanted to go long or short, but you could see it was obviously all over the place. And I think they wanted to buy it, if memory serves. Now, along the lines of trading clean, cleanly, let me rewind that. Along the lines of trading cleanly, is the stock in an obvious trend or an obvious emerging trend? So we go back to the previous example. This stock was in an obvious trend. How do I know? Well, the net net price change from here to here was very significant. And more importantly, I could draw a big blue arrow on the chart. That's how you know. Linda Rasky used to say, if you don't know what direction a stock is headed, ask a six-year-old kid. I've quoted her so many times, people begin quoting that, saying that I said it, and then I noticed that in more recent times, people have forgot to give anybody credit. So I don't say it as much as I used to, but that does that is a Linda Rasky quote. Now, this is a little bit harder, an obvious emerging trend. And as I often say, I get more questions about my emerging trend patterns than all of my other patterns combined. So it does take a little skill and experience to begin to recognize these emerging trends. One thing that can, and can be in the keyword in that sentence, help is to plot the bow tie moving averages on the chart. Now, when a stock has a gradual rollover like this, then the moving averages catch up fairly quickly and it becomes fairly obvious that that trend has begun to turn. And this is a stock where we're actually short. It really hasn't worked out great just yet, but it sure looked like the trend had changed at the time. We're going to get to postmortems in just one second. But notice that the stock does trade fairly cleanly, very persistent at its uptrend here. And then it just went sideways, consolidated for a while, tried to get to new highs, but then came right back in. But again, very clean trading stock. Very obvious change in trend here as evidenced by the bow ties and, again, by the net net price change relative to the stock's volatility. Now, you also need to ask yourself, are there any big picture patterns? such as a major double bottom or a recent huge base that might suggest that a bigger picture move could be in the works. Now, I don't trade directly off of this big picture technical analysis, such as double bottoms, head and shoulder tops, etc. but I do factor it into my analysis. So in this particular case, yes, we had the bow tie, but that also set up within a longer term base which was two or I should say one major double bottom 
So all of this action, combined with a big picture saucer and handle, and a bow tie, of course, suggests that a major bottom, in this particular case, was in the works. Now, the next thing you need to ask yourself is, is there clear air above? In other words, overhead supply. Remember, if there's a significant amount of trading above where you enter, those who bought in an area will likely be looking to bail out and break even. It's human nature. I've told the story quite a bit. I have a neighbor. He called me one day. He wanted to buy GE. And I was looking at GE, and there was a whole bunch of trading between 18 and 21. And it was now trading down around 12, 13, and 14, somewhere substantially lower. And I said, I don't know. I, I think if you bought it here, it could run into trouble. There's a lot of trading between 18 and 21. Whoever owned the stock in that area might be looking to get out to break even. Then he said, oh, I, I bought it at 18. So that tells me right there that technical analysis is alive and well. Technical analysis works. Why? Because of human nature. If you've come to these shows, if you read my books, if you read my articles, come to the webinars, you know that my approach is conceptually correct. And by that, I mean there has to be some sort of psychological backing. As I often preach, my version of technical analysis is using the charts to read the emotions of the market while at the same time embracing your own. Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And if you substitute the word world with the word markets, then that makes a lot of sense. If the markets were perfect, they wouldn't be. Everyone would agree on price. It's the emotions of the market participants which allow you to profit, provided, of course, you're willing to embrace, not control, as often preached, because we all have emotions that you cannot eliminate. Now, in this particular case, there was a little bit of overhead supply here, but that was about 50% above the entry. It wasn't a tremendous amount, and it was also way back in time. Now, I spent a lot of time in trading full circle going over overhead supply. That's the gist of it. How far back in time is the first question you need to ask yourself. How far above the market? Let's rewind that. How far above the market? This should be number one. Okay. If it's 100% away, yeah, 100%, that'd be great to make that on the trade. And if it can go up 100%, it might be able to get through that overhead supply. How far back in time would be the next question to ask yourself. And how long and wide is that overhead supply? So it's a very simple concept, but there's a lot to it. The good news is it's mostly common sense. Now, does the setup meet all the criteria for the setup? What is kind of shocking to me, and I'm not talking about people who are new to my methodology. That's understandable. But people who should know better send me mediocre charts all the time that don't really fit at least the spirit of the setup. Maybe they fit it on a somewhat mechanical level, like, yes, it did take out two lows as per rule four. But as a general statement, it doesn't fit the author's intent or the designer's intent. So in a case like this, this is actually a computer-recognized signal, but you can see that it's a very valid signal. As I often say with something like a TKL, which makes for great examples, it should stick out like a sore thumb. So you've got all these nice, cleanly traded bars, and all of a sudden, bam, you got this big down move here, the TKO. And, of course, what do you need with a TKO? A big blue arrow. So, again, it needs to be obvious if you zoom that in, which you shouldn't have to, looking at this chart. But if you did zoom it in, 
you could see that this bar down was very, very, very significant, and it took out quite a few lows in the process. Now, if the stock does pass muster, here's some questions you need to ask yourself. Is the representative sector also trending? You have to stack the odds in your favor. If you're looking at a semiconductor, make sure the semiconductors are also trending. Now, here's a biggie. Not only look at the semiconductors, but also look a little bit under the hood. Make sure that all the stocks within the sector are also trending. Sometimes, depending on the index or the ETF you're looking at, just a few components could be doing very well while the rest of the sector is not doing so hot or as choppy or however you want to look at it. So you have to look under the hood a little bit. This is a game of clues. And you want to make sure you have as much evidence as possible. So the stock is trending or making an obvious change in trend. In other words, an emerging trend. Stocks within the sector are also trending. Now you take that one step further. Have you gone through all of the tradable stocks within the sector to see if there are any of the sexy sisters or brothers, depending on when you're into? I guess nowadays you could be both. Anyway, I digress. Sometimes a good setup in one sector can lead to a great sector within that setup. And that's especially true within that sector. And that's especially true when you're doing your watch list. And let's say you've got like biotech here and you got, I don't know, just Amgen or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you've got your semis down here. This is your little watch list you're creating. And under semis, you might have uh, Intel, which I'd probably never trade. It's such a big cap stock. But then some smaller ones, AMD. I'm trying to think. Well, that's not smaller. But you get the idea, Micron, whatever. I could just think of the big ones at the moment. And when you look at your list, and if you see that you have a lot of semiconductors, Maybe that's where you should be trading. And then you do take that one step further. If you find one of these setups you like, look through all the other tradable semiconductors. And sometimes a good setup, again, in one sector can lead to a great setup within that sector once you do a little digging and look under the hood. Now, is the overall market headed in the intended direction? And I'm going to beat the dead horse again on the net net price movement. And all you need to do is look at the price today and look back a week, a month, two months, three months, and so on and so forth to see what the price is. Okay. If it hasn't made any significant movement or going, in other words, it has gone sideways, then it's probably not a great market for trend following. If the net net move is headed lower, if the market, in other words, is lower than it was a few weeks, months, or longer, then maybe it's not a good idea to buy any stocks, with a few exceptions. Do you think you have the mother of all setups? In other words, a stock that can trade contra to the overall market or ignore the action in the overall market. Sometimes that's a commodity stock. I say sometimes because sometimes commodities go lower too with the overall market. Right now, energies are headed higher, and we'll look at that in just one second. But right now, energies are headed higher. This is May 2018 for reference. And the stocks overall, or stock, the stock market overall, has been mostly sideways. So maybe, just maybe, there might be some opportunities within the energies. The other thing you need to look for is something a little bit more speculative, something that wouldn't know a fundamental if it hit him in the ass, such as an IPO. Now, I know I just said the F word, fundamentals. I said it again. Now, I don't use fundamentals, but a stock that does have fundamentals, in other words, earnings, 
and tangible assets, et cetera, things that can be kind of put together in some sort somebody's model and judged against the overall market, such as the PE, for instance. And people say, Dave, you use PE? It's like, yeah, I just use a numerator. Okay. PE. I do use PE, but I just use the numerator of the PE. In other words, price over earnings. I just use price. Isn't it amazing, by the way, that the most popular fundamental indicator there is has price as the numerator? Isn't that ironic? Don't you think? Now, before I digress too far, again, something speculative like an IPO is going to trade purely on emotions for the most part. And that's why I love something like IPOs and small cap stocks in general. Now, here's the net net thing that I beat the dead horse on quite often. Always ask yourself, this goes for the market, for the sector, for the stocks within the sector. Is the market higher? Is the market lower? Or is it pretty much the same as it was? Draw a line going backwards, connect the dots, or as I often say, apply the Rip Van Winkle sleep test. Pretend that you looked at a newspaper. I don't know if newspapers still exist, but imagine they did. And you looked at your stock quote printed in a newspaper. You fell asleep for a few weeks, few months, or longer. You woke up, you got a newspaper, and you noticed that the price was relatively unchanged. You'll think, well, nothing happened with that stock. Now, the reason I use that Rip Van Winkle sleep test is when you're in the thick of it and you're watching every tick, a lot of times you get kind of caught up in the moment and you forget about the bigger picture. You don't see the forest for the trees. Now, a lot of times people will say, well, Dave, that's in hindsight. Well, yeah, but you have to recognize when the trend is there in real time. For instance, I've been drawing a sideways arrow in the indices for a long time, and the market's been headed sideways for a long time. I had a friend of mine, I wrote about this week recently in a column, I believe I titled Technical Analysis is Alive and Well. And he was saying, oh, he, he bought this company because he liked the CEO, and then he, then he bought some because it seemed low, and then he bought on the way down. And then he bought more because it was cheap and he was going to flip it out at break even. Well, he asked, I, well, excuse me. I said, okay, let's refill your beer. Let's go to my office and let's take a look at the chart. So I pulled the chart up and the first thing I did was draw a big blue arrow. And he goes, oh, that's in hindsight. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, you said you bought because you like the CEO. You said you bought some because it seemed low. You said you bought some on the way down. And then you told me, because it was cheap, way down here where it is now, that you recently just bought some more. So, yes, the big blue arrow can often be in hindsight, but it doesn't always have to be. A lot of times people will fight the trend even though it is obvious. Now, this is one thing that you always have to do. Have you weighed all of the above with the potential choice of not taking any new action? I'm a huge Tim Ferriss fan, and I've often talked about the can't stand it test. If you can't stand it, if you're so excited, I've been talking about this for years and years and years, when you see a setup, if you're so excited and all the pieces fit, or you just think you have the mother of, uh, mother of all standalone setups, then by all means, take the trade. In more recent times, 
been reading some Tim Ferriss, and he and a lot of people that they interview say that it should be an F yeah on any decisions. I get approached with a lot of decisions outside the market daily, and I've been applying that. And boy, that's been really helping me out. And now I realize how many things that I say yes to because I'm such a yes man that have really been taking up my time and don't have really big payoffs where now I know, you know what, if I'm not feeling an F yeah, then I shouldn't take it. So apply the F yeah decisions to your trade. You should be excited about a trade. You shouldn't be whole hum about going into a trade. So if you don't feel that F yeah, then pass. Now, you have to be careful as a person of action. How did you, I have a dog trainer as a client. How did he become successful as a dog trainer? Well, he trains dogs. I have a surgeon or two as clients. How did they become successful as surgeons? They operate on people. I used to have a welder. I don't know if I do any more. And at one point, I had an automatic transmission mechanic. But how did they become successful? Well, they worked on transmissions. But if people have action, it's hard not to do anything. I think it was Ken Lambert said, doing nothing is harder than it looks. And it is. The more successful you are, the harder it is to do nothing. And that's because you became successful by doing something. By working hard, by being ambitious. That's how you grew your business or succeeded in your career. It's very hard for highly motivated and successful people to not do anything. What's ironic is trading attracts the absolute worst people that should be traders. Except for the hard work and finding the setups. The best traders would probably be people that are a little bit more lazy. And that way they're not taking any unnecessary action. Now, what's the only reason you should ever make a trade? There's only one reason to ever make a trade, and that is to make money. And never for action. As I've said quite often, better to be on the dock drinking beer, wishing you were out to sea, than out to sea, wishing you were on the dock. And I'll just summarize because I've told the story over and over. But one time I was in a low pressure system. We were on a little boat, the smallest boat in the fleet. And we were a couple hundred miles off the Texas coast, maybe 150 miles off the Texas coast. Doesn't matter. Once, once you're 30, 40 miles offshore, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, we were caught in a low-pressure system for about 30, 30 hours. Fortunately, we decided to abandon, abandon the race, turned around. We were able to get back safely. I was once on the biggest boat in the fleet, and we nearly sank. We're about 400 miles off the coast of Charleston and a little bit over 400 miles, I believe, off the coast of Bermuda. We were a long ways out. Would have taken somebody a long time to get to us. And we were going down fairly quickly. There also wasn't enough room in the life raft. By the way, get on a sinking boat and your head will clear. <laughs> You're not worried about anything. Anything trivial, that is. No small stuff. Anyway, so it's better to be on the dock. In other words, it's better not to put any capital into harm's way. Now, I'm sure Greg can attest the same thing, and I actually heard him say it before as a pilot. That's an old pilot saying, too. I thought it was just us sailors that said that. But I guess it's even more true for the pilot. Now, as I talked about last week, the process is very important in your planning phase. Make sure you have confidence 
in your analysis. In other words, you have that excitement. You feel good. You know the pattern, as I talked about when we talked about the process of all this. Make sure that you, first of all, have confidence in your methodology in and of itself, that you have at least found 100 examples historically of the setup that you're going to trade. And then in doing your analysis, you've weighed that against doing nothing, and you have that F yeah feeling. Then, of course, you need a plan. During the planning phase, what do you need? Well, you got to determine where you're going to enter, where you're going to put the stop, where you're going to put the initial profit target, and how you're going to trail that stop. Now, as I often say, I could never figure out why people won't bother to plan their trades. And one day I went for a walk and I was thinking about it. And it kind of hit me. The moment you plan a trade, you have to put a stop in, right? As I just showed you, it's part of the list. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you could be wrong. Now, I recently read an Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, which is a very good read, by the way. I suggest you read it. Go to Books to Read on my website. Check that out. Coming to peace with a bad outcome in advance will feel better than refusing to acknowledge it, facing it only after it has happened. As I say ad nauseum, I'm sick of myself saying it, but it makes so much sense. No one knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. So we could be wrong in everything we do. We're stepping into the unknown as soon as we actually place that trade. But if you come to peace with the fact that you could be wrong, you still might drop an F-bomb if you get stopped out, but at least you sort of, I don't want to say expected it, but you knew that it could happen. When we think advance about the chances of alternate outcomes and make a decision based on those chances, it doesn't automatically make us wrong when things don't work out. It just means that one event in a set of possible futures has occurred. Mark Douglas once said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. So think about that. Somebody on a trading desk, fat fingers, an order, and it doesn't even have to be somebody in the trading world, okay? I remember years ago, I had a sizable futures position on in the S&P futures back when they didn't have the little E-mini contract, and I think each point back then was 500 points, $500, 1000 I forget. It's been so long. And I felt like a friggin' genius because I was making a lot of money. I had a little system I was following, and I was doing a really good job being a good little system follower, a little trend follower. And I'm like, you know what? I think I'm going to go grab a shower because I'm so smart, and I'm singing in the shower, feeling how smart I am. I'm going to get back from the shower. Actually, I stuck my head out. I was watching the futures on CNBC, and I saw that they were plunging. So I got to my office as quickly as possible, saw that I got stopped out of my beautifully executed position. Well, what happened? Did somebody fat finger someone? Did a bad earnings report come out? What happened? Well, no, some idiots started shooting people in the nation's capital, and the stock market began to plunge. So, again, if it doesn't it doesn't automatically make us wrong when things don't work out. It just means that one event and a set of possible events occur. Coming to grips with that is much easier said than done. But we have to. While I was at dinner with Greg, he says, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, I'm going to speak for four hours. He says, oh, good for you. 
But how in the world are you going to speak for four hours about this? And he makes an upward motion with his arm. And then he made a downward motion with his arm and said, in this. In other words, an uptrend and a downtrend. And I said, well, Greg, there's also this. And I made a sideways motion. And I said, well, seriously, I'm going to talk about my setups, obviously, money management. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on psychology, little things such as how we have these emotional responses that are very quick but can get us in a lot of trouble. And that's because we have this amygdala thing, obviously, deep in our brain that causes us to make these panicky decisions. And Greg says, wind the clock. And I said, excuse me? I said, let me rewind that. So we have this amygdala that causes us to make these panicky decisions. However, it only takes a few seconds to bypass that amygdala to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there so you don't make this emotionally charged decision. And then he said, wind the clock. And I said, excuse me? He says, wind the clock. It's like, oh, okay. That was a reference from his book, Investing the Trend. And he went on to say that when they were in these flight simulators, which he also wrote about in the book, and what they would do is try to trick up the pilots while they were in the flight simulator. It's better to crash the simulator on the ground than crash an F-4, right? So they would put alarms and try to trick them up best they could. And he actually would make some emotionally charged decisions very early on in the process. And he realized that, okay, well, I've, I have to succumb this, obviously, or I'm not going to be a pilot, at least not for very long. So what he would do was he would wind the clock. And back then there was an actual clock, an analog clock. And when they started sending alarms his way, he would literally wind the clock. And then that way he was able to, excuse me one second. I'm waiting on some important messages, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so he would wind a clock. Now, instead of panicking, he would take a second, wind a clock, and all it takes is a few seconds to bypass that amygdala, again, to get to what it, the rest of what's sloshing around up there, to make a rational decision. And then he would act accordingly. Now, he went on to say that later on, in his commercial airline career, what he would do was he would simulate the winding of the clock. He would metaphorically wind the clock, touch the dash or something or whatever you call it in the cockpit to give him that second or two to engage the rest of your brain. Your amygdala is a very, very small part of your brain and you need it to survive. You need to be able to jump out of the way of a moving taxi before it hits you. You can't, as I often say, think about the driver and why is he driving so fast and does he like me and all these other things. You just have to get out of the way. It has to be a reflexive reaction. But in situations where you could be prone to panic, you have to somehow suppress that amygdala Give yourself a few seconds and then use a wrestle with sloshing around up there. He gave a great example because I asked him, I said, have you ever lost an engine? He's like, oh, sure. You know, he's so calm and laid back. He's got ice in his veins. He said that once they lost an engine, and I think they were fairly close to landing, and the co-pilot immediately said, you want me to shut that engine off? And Greg said no, and then he metaphorically went on the clock and said, no, don't shut it off because you risk the possibility of shutting off the good engine and there's no guarantee that we'll restart it. Leave it on. We'll monitor the situation. If we absolutely have to, we'll shut off the bad engine. I guess if there was a fire or something in it. 
as opposed to just some sort of mechanical malfunction. So he's had quite a few of those wind the clock moments. Now, as I talked about in trading full circle, you don't want to wake the little panic monster. The panic monster is your amygdala. This is the primal part of your brain I've been referring to. It's part of your limbic system. It's way down here. It's probably not even that big. It's a little tiny part of your brain. And that's where all your emotions come from. Sometimes just a few seconds is all that's needed to avoid making that emotionally charged decision. So you want to embrace that little tiny part of your brain. And again, I've said this quite a few times, but this is a great little exercise. The next time you find yourself ready to have an emotional reaction to your spouse or significant other, and who am I to judge, but you probably shouldn't have both. Otherwise, you might have a little bit too much stress to trade. Then don't. Don't immediately respond. Here's all you have to do. Count to three. I told my wife this, and she said, do you do that? Really? Really, huh? I said, well, I thought to myself, you have no idea how many times since I learned about the amygdala I have counted to three. Dr. Robert Mara in the Kaizen way, how one small step can change your life, talked about tiptoeing past your fears. And I would encourage you to read this book. Very short read, very simple, plain English but a uh, good, little, good little book, lots of good information in there. The gist of a lot of what he's saying is if you try to make this big, huge decision, like I'm going to be the disciplined trader or I'm going to lose all this weight. I have friends, and I was guilty of the same thing too, but I have friends that go on all these crazy diets, and they always end up fatter than they were before and why is that well they make these big drastic changes and they just can't sustain them whatever you do it has to be sustainable you have to gradually make some of these changes and i think by simply winding the clock very small thing to do as i said last week i have a little clock on my desk that little aviation clock which was pictured a couple slides ago and now before I make a trade I wind a clock I know myself if I'm watching a screen I'm gonna get excited and want to make a trade either an unnecessary trade such as a day trade or something and there's nothing wrong with day trading I suggest that you don't simply because we're just not wired to make that many decisions you also get caught up in the moment and every little tick looks like something that's a lot bigger than it is anyway my little tiptoeing past my amygdala is to just simply wind the clock whenever I go to make a trade and after that second or two it takes to wind the clock if I still want to make the trade I'll make the trade place the order so you want to tiptoe past the panic monster, and that's such an easy thing to do, meaning that you just have to wait a few seconds before taking action. I like to, I think trading is a metaphor for life a lot of times. I like to pay attention to what's going on in my life and use these same concepts that I use in the trading world. And that's why I try, try being a keyword in that sentence, to count to three or just take a breath. If I'm going to have that snap reaction back to my wife, Marcy, I now take a deep breath because I have to take a breath anyway, right? I now take a deep breath, let it out, or at least I try to. And a lot of times that saved my butt. So you have to tiptoe past the panic, panic monster. You have to trick 
your amygdala. Now, during a trade, there's only five things that you should ever be doing. Number one, did the stock trigger an entry? And if so, did you enter? As I often say, I get emails all the time. Okay, here's my plan. We're going to enter at $10 a share. And the next day, the stock triggers an entry. Three days later, not all the time, I wish all the time, but not all the time, but stock will be two or three points higher. I'll get an email. Hey, Dave, I didn't take XYZ. What should I do? Well, it's gone, just like the Frozen song, just let it go. But if you truly wanted to take the setup, and in these cases, they did, they just did do it for whatever reasons. They saw it trigger, they watched it, they decided let's just watch it for a day or so to see what happens. Maybe it triggered and came right back in. So instead of making that one decision to get into the trade, now they're faced with multiple decisions. And as I preach ad nauseum, every decision comes with stress and a consequence. And the more decisions you make, the more stress and consequences you will have. That's why day traders have a very high burnout rate, as do air traffic controllers, ER doctors, etc. So number one, did the stock trigger an entry? Did you take the entry? Now, you got to remember, okay, not that me recommending a setup is going to be all in, is the be all end all. I don't want to imply that. What I am implying here is that you did your homework and you said, yeah, the stock market's trending. The sector's trending. Stocks within the sector are trending. I looked at every other stock within the sector. They were trending too. And guess what? I did pick the best setup out of all the stocks. And I'm feeling that F, yeah, on this setup. So I'm saying you feel all that going into the trade. Not just because Big Dave likes a stock, because you also like the stock and you also did a little due diligence and said, you know what, I, I think he's right on that. Let's go with that. Or you did all this on your own. Now, once you trigger in the stock, the next thing is, did you place a protective stop once triggered? I like to use alerts. I think I'm going to start calling them alarms as opposed to alerts. I like to use an alarm where my stop is. Now, if the stop is a long ways away, then I'll use an actual hard stop in the market. But you need to ask yourself, did you place a protective stop? And if you're a little bit more disciplined, did you place an alarm near where that stock stop would be so you would take action, no questions asked? If you're newer to trading and you're lacking a little discipline, or I should say, if you're newer to trading and or lack discipline, then you need to place an actual protective stop. And again, once the protective stop gets kind of far away from the market, I'll actually place a protective stop. And that's when once a trailing stop has begun to widen out, which brings us to point three. So the question is, did the stock move in your favor on a closing basis? And if so, did you trail a stop higher? So the methodology says that if the stock closes higher, that we are going to stair step of stop higher every time it closes higher. Now, once we take partial profits, which is point four, we then allow that stop to gradually loosen up to make the transition to the longer term trader. See all the things that I've talked about under money management. So if it does begin to rally and it hits that initial profit target, did it hit it, first of all, and did you take partial profits? Half. Now, this is my way of doing things. It's not my way or highway, but this is a hybrid approach 
to money management. It's the best way I found after many, many years of searching to have you cake and eat it too, to trade for both short term and longer term gains. Again, I'd refer you back to all the information that I published on money management. So did the stock hit your initial profit target? And if it did, did you take the partial profits? And what we do is we make sure that stop is up to break even once that initial profit target is hit. And then at this point, we gradually loosen our stop. And that's often not by doing anything. We don't move the stop in the opposite of the way of the market. We move it in a direction of the market, but more slowly than that stair step fashion. And that's done from a variety in a variety of ways. For instance, let's say the stock goes up 25 cents. Well, if you leave your stop where it is, and the stock is up here, goes up 25 cents. If you leave your stop where it is, incrementally, it's increased by that very small amount. I call it keep the change. Another thing I often talk about is, let's say you're blessed with like a three-point move. Stock goes from here to here, and let's say that's three points. Well, you might take your stop and just raise it two points plus two. Now your stop, three minus two is what? One. Your stop is widened out by one point. We're trying to gradually loosen those stops. And often it's naturally by not doing anything. In order to make the transition from the shorter term trader, the little swing trader right here, to the longer term trend follower. This is where the money is, okay? It's also less predictable. And that's why we made the transition. Now, here's a biggie. I often talk about micromanagement. I have a lesson. It's a multi-point. Let me rewind that. I have a lesson that says the one thing that's standing to... Jeez. <laughs> I have a lesson that talks about the one thing that stands between you and your success. Gosh, one more time. I have a lesson that says the one thing that talks, that stands between you and your success, and that is micromanagement. That's the biggest sin I see in trading. Now, if you really want to get better at trading, trading, you need to practice deliberate practice. And the best way to do that there's two ways of doing it. One, you could do it when you're doing your analysis. As I often preach, if you see a stock that takes off, honestly ask yourself, hey, could I have gotten in this position? Should I have gotten in this position? And sometimes a market will just take off with no pattern or not a pattern that you're trading. That's okay. You can't kiss all the woman, women unless you're Harvey Weinstein, and now he's beginning to pay for that. So, that's deliberate practice while you're doing your analysis. Deliberate practice after the trade is done would be through your postmortem. And this is how you really get good at trading. Did you really pick the best and leave the rest? Circle back to your pre trade checklist and relive everything. Now, this is in perfect hindsight, but if you do this enough, as I often say, if you get the reps in, rinse and repeat. You're going to get better and better and better. As I also often say, a lot of times early in my career, I would look back at a trade and say, what the hell was I thinking? Now, here's the hard part. Regardless of the outcome, let's say you did incredibly well on that trade. Well, outcomes are noisy. I think it was Terrence O'Dean that said that. Many bad decisions have good outcomes and vice versa. Many good decisions have bad outcomes. It all kind of comes back to a lot of the things in research that Annie Duke talked about in Thinking in Bets. So you can't reward yourself. or It's okay to feel good, obviously, because it, we're all human, right? But you got to be really careful not to let that market be a bad teacher and just because you did something stupid and made a lot of money doesn't mean that you should continue to do something stupid. So circle back, and as I often preach, make sure you follow the 
process. There's a four-part series in the learning management system, which is currently not public yet, but it will be, which talks specifically on following that process. As a, If you want to see a sneak peek of that, go in and watch the week of charts that I did two weeks ago on that. Very important stuff. As Charlie Munger said, think like world-class professional bridge player Richard Zeckhauser, who scores himself based, based not so much on whether he won the hand, but rather how he played it. Annie Duke and Thinking in Bets, coming back to that book once again, talked about one of the poker players who... When they go to the bar, most poker players get to the bar afterwards and they brag about how they kick butt and how they played this and how how they won. But this one guy is a little bit more subdued, a lot more subdued. He would say he kind of beat himself up when he won. And he'd say, well, I didn't, you know, I probably should have folded this hand or I probably should have done this. So he's thinking more like a chess player, which is a lot more mechanical. And according to Andy Duke's book, is is purely mechanical. I don't I don't play enough chess to know that. Whereas a game like poker and trading, there is a variable, and that variable is the unknown. And I guess luck would be a better way of putting it. So you have to separate luck from skill, and that's not easy. But if you want to give yourself points, give yourself points for following the process versus not following the process, regardless of the outcome. Outcome bias is something very important. And it's very hard not to have an outcome bias. And I remember, as I often say, I recommended a trade, which was a risky, stupid trade. And I got called on it by a hedge fund manager. And I said, well, it worked, didn't it? Which is, was a little bit of a flippant comment. I should have just kind of tucked my tail between my legs and walked off when I was being chastised. And he immediately came back with, well, he sure picked up nickels in front of that bulldozer. And he was right. Outcomes don't tell us what's our fault and what isn't and what we should take credit for and what we shouldn't. And that's what makes trading kind of tough. Again, circling back to Odin, that outcomes or noisy. Now this one's a little obvious and it goes along the cliche of plan your trade and trade your plan. How many times have we all heard that? Well, did you truly plan your trade ahead of time? Did you plan your trade or did you just wing it? A lot of people, and I am used to be really guilty as charge. I've gotten better at it. I'm not going to say I'm perfect because I'll occasionally fire off a trade every now and then. I probably shouldn't fire off guilty as charge. But did you truly plan your trade ahead of time? One of the constant emails that I get, hey, Dave, I'm down 50% in XYZ. What should I do? Well, I always come back with immediately, well, what was your original plan? Certainly, you didn't plan to lose half of your money on, the, on that trade. What was your original plan? Well, obviously, they didn't have one. So hopefully, that's a one and done email where I say, okay, well, Everybody makes mistakes. Let's learn from this. I think in Jesse Livermore's book, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, which was written under a pen name, FYI. But he said if a man didn't make a mistake, he would own the world in a month. So you have to learn from your mistakes. If he, if he didn't learn from his mistakes, he would never earn a blessed thing. I need to work on that quote a little bit, but that's the gist of it. 
So as long as you learn from your mistakes, try not to make the same mistake twice. Did you follow the plan? Well, if you're down 50% in a stock or the market, either you, A, you didn't plan your trade, or B, you didn't follow the plan. It's, it's that simple. And that's what always amazes me. I never said easy because I struggle with my trading like everyone else, right? But when I take a step back and think through it, it really is that simple. You pick the best, leave the rest, plan the trade, trade the plan. That's it. My work is done. I'm just going to drop my mic. Peace out. All right. My work's not done. Why? Because people don't do that. My wife always says, I, I ask her, and I no longer ask her. She always says the same thing. It's like, hey, babe, what do you think about the column? Well, you say a lot of the same shit. It's like, Ugh. yeah, well, I'm going to keep saying the same shit until you people get it. The bottom line is we're only human born to make mistakes, as the aging band on their 401k tour once sang. I guess they're still singing it. So can we boil all this down? Yes. Take a breath. Wind the clock and check your checklist. All right, any questions or comments on that? You survived the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, the Bermuda Triangle is huge, though. I've been in it many, many, many times. It's like you look at the uh, <laughs> you look at the the map of the Bermuda Triangle, and it's half the friggin' ocean. So yeah, a lot of boats are likely to sink in that big of an area. Okay, last week, it was kind of cool. Right as I was going to start my presentation, I noticed that a trailing stop that I was using was equated to a moving average. This is a 200-hour moving average, but as you know, moving averages just go off period. So a 200-period Moving average on an hourly would be a 200-day moving average when you switch over to a daily chart. Now, I don't want to confuse you. Some people will actually plot a different moving average on one chart. For instance, they might plot, I don't, I forget which one it is, but you'll plot one moving average. This moving average here, let's just say we plot a long-term moving average, will be the same as the 50-day moving average on a daily chart. This is an hourly chart. That's not what I'm doing here. This is an actual 200-hour moving average, okay? And I just thought it was cool that the moving average and the trailing stop were at the same spot. And many times I'm asked because the way I draw them, I used to actually draw in my trailing stops when I do presentations. I would look at each little day and I would draw them in. And this would take me hours to show that I was letting that stop open up. But now what I do is I just kind of take an average of these and I just, you know, draw my line. And a lot of times I'll have a chart show and I'll have that stop drawn in, that trailing stop. And people will say, Dave, is that a moving average? It's like, no, it's not a moving average. What I'm doing is I'm gradually loosening, loosening up that stop. And as I draw it in, it begins to look like a longer term moving average. So last week I threw out fodder for research saying, and this is something I've done many, many times in the past. Let's say you get into a stock or other market and you're used, this is the Euro by, uh, versus dollar, by the way, Euro USD. By the way, I often say stock because that's my predominant focus, but I will trade any market. A friend of mine, an Indian guy, nice guy, used to say, uh, if Dave, if Dave found out that hypothetical, hypothetical, this guy really does talk like, I know everybody imitates, sounds like that, but this guy actually talks like this. If Dave found out that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would be buying hypothermic needles. Well, I'm not that bad, but drug use is not on the rise, is it? Anyway, what I was saying last week is, let's say you got, if you're making a system, 
and you would use like a five day moving average as your stop. And then as it moved in your favor, you would transition that to a 10 day, 10 day moving average and so on and so forth, because eventually my stop will look like a moving average. Now, one thing that I failed to mention last week and as I watched the position develop this week is that the only caveat to doing that would be that my system, the stop stays the same when the market is flat, okay? But if you were trailing that moving average, what would happen is through the, if you want to call it time decay or time, this moving average will continue to come lower. And the reason is because of the drop-off effect. You're adding in these lower prices and you're taking off prices from up here. So even though price remains relatively unchanged, this will continue to drop. Now, that's not exactly the way I like to do things. I like to give positions a lot of room as they move more and more in my favor. I've already taken partial profits on this trade, so I'm allowing that stop to open up. So the original fodder for research I threw out last week was that you would just start off with an X period moving average, and then you would just add to that moving average to make it a longer and longer term moving average. Well, I didn't think about the drop off effect. And I think this is why I had trouble with the research early on in my career when I did a lot of mechanical testing. But I just wanted to throw that out. Now, some people are OK with a time type of stop where you tighten it over time. But I like to just give them a lot of room and forget about time. Your life gets a lot easier when you forget about time in the markets. And I think I'm kind of backing into something here. I think that that's probably one of the secrets of the market is forget about time. And I guess I'm just, I guess that's a fancy way of saying be patient as I often preach. Anyway, so that's one of the aberrations that would happen. Now, I just captured this shot right before we went live and it would have made a great example if it would have nailed that, that moving average, but it didn't. The point is that through this sideways action here, you can see this moving average continue to drop, okay? So I gave up that lots of wiggle room. I'm sorry, if you would have put your stop with the moving average, you would have given up that wiggle room on the trade. So just kind of fodder for research, something to think about. If you guys mess around with these moving averages as stops, increasing the moving average with time, let me know what you come up with. One thing I was thinking about, but this is where things start getting kind of complex. It's like, well, we're going to take the 200-day moving average, but if the 200-day moving average or whatever period moving average that we've morphed into, if the price is headed higher and the drop-off effect would cause the moving average to drop, then we're going to leave the stop where it is. And then maybe when it gets to new lows, we'll start to resume that trailing stop. I don't know. But see, the problem with that is now you're becoming, it's becoming much more complex. But if you guys noodle around with that, just let me know. As you know, I like to throw out a little fodder for research here and there. All right, a couple of announcements real quick and we'll hop to the live charts, I promise. The first four videos of Trading Full Circle, I've gotten quite a few good comments on that. Like one guy, I couldn't believe that I'm actually giving away something that's useful. So just go to daylander.com 2 trade stock successfully. I guess I need to shorten that arrow. And you can watch the first videos for free. I've been working on the LMS system, the learning management system for last couple of years. And Last year, I rolled out Trading Full Circle in that. And this year, I took on a super ambitious project to take 20-something years of my knowledge and posts and videos and webinars and everything that I've done, especially over the last five years or so on the website, and turn that into a massive learning management system and i'm really excited about this maybe i'm drinking my own kool-aid but i feel like if you wanted to trade in a conceptually correct way and follow my methodology if i get this thing launched before i get hit by a beer truck, beer truck that is but if i got hit by a beer truck i should say after it was launched you should be able to take the ball and run with it 
Larry Connors once told me, I think when I was working on my first book, he said, write like you're dying and you have to pass on this knowledge to your family so they can survive based on this knowledge. So every time I approach a course or something along those lines, that's my thinking. Somebody once said, you have a ton of great content. Why do you hide it? So I'm going to work to bring that to light. And this is a sneak peek of what it's going to look like. There's going to be, I'm going to do some members only shorter webinars to make sure you guys can get your questions answered. We'll have a Facebook group and I'm pretty excited about the whole thing. And then under courses, oh, I know what's wrong. So under courses, obviously trading full circle in the micro course, I'm Working to put the IPO course in here and also the stock selection course will be next. I'm cleaning up those files, editing them out, editing out the uhs and spaces and irrelevant information, ramblings that are irrelevant. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be really cool to know where you are. And this way, if somebody asked me a question about something, I could say, OK, well, that was under mindset. That was under money management. Earlier, I talked a lot about money management. Well, it's all going to be here and available to the members. I'm pretty excited about it. I'm pretty excited about this holistic trader, too. Holistic trader, he tried to say, which is a combination of these three plus a little more. And that's very important. Anyway, I'm such a nerd. All right, let's hop out into the charts. You guys start asking about uh, individual stocks now, if you like to, or any other questions. And then I'm going to go through the market real quick. We'll go through a few sectors, and then we should have plenty enough time for everybody's questions. Donald says, I think if you were to use an exponential moving average, the drop-off effect would be reduced, maybe even eliminated. Um, mm, yeah, I don't know. I have to think about that. But it might catch up too fast initially. So that that's a, that's an interesting point. You know what? Just for S&Gs. What do we have up here? Let's put in the uh, S&P 500. Let's take a look at the 200 exponential and a 200. Uh, I never used a 200 exponential, or at least not in my analysis. Let's add in a 200 exponential moving average. And let's make that some other color. Let's make it uh, orange. Well, you can see, hmm, there's not a whole lot of difference. That's kind of interesting. There's not a whole lot of difference, at least from where I sit. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Hmm. Now, okay, I see what happens here. So there are times when that does catch up pretty quick. But I see what you're saying. I guess it stops dropping off. Well, a 200 will turn up, and I learned this from Greg Morris, will turn up the day prices cross. I'm sorry, any moving average that's exponential. Let's put in a 50 exponential and see what happens. It will turn up the day price crosses above it. So, for instance, and I think this was in the first four videos. Again, good stuff in there for free. So on this day here, price is above the 50-day moving average. Notice if you kind of squint your eyes, it has a positive slope. Let's put in the simple 50 real quick. So you can tell from my excitement, I have to be careful. If I start messing around too much with indicators, I'll get kind of, I'll end up in that rabbit hole, going down that rabbit hole of holy grail hunting. But yeah, case in point, you can see that the exponential moving average down here is headed up. And the 50-day was still headed down at this juncture. Now it's starting to flatten out. But, yeah, play around with that. You know, again, the problem is you start messing around with all that. Then it gets more and more complex. And that's why I've, I've, I try to resist the temptation of mechanical testing anymore. I just go off, as I think I said last week, off of conceptually correct observational finance. Video's not showing? It should be. 
Well, the recordings are fairly robust, so the good news is we'll get a recording of this this week, I hope. <laughs> all right, let's look at the peas. Not bad. Not bad at all. We're up another what? How many percent is that? Where's my percent? Oh, there it is. Almost 1% today. So not a bad day at all. We're right at these multi-month highs. Unfortunately, one thing that you have to look at is the net-net price change is still not so hot. So I'm very encouraged by the fact that the market's rallying. I'm glad it's rallying. I prefer uptrends more than downtrends. But as Gary Kaltbaum once said, give me an uptrend, give me a downtrend, or give me a ticket to Tahiti. I agree with you, Gary, my brother from another mother. So we're at multi-month highs. I wouldn't, as I said in the market a minute this morning, let's not start kissing each other just yet. As usual, follow-through will be key. And as you can see, we have a bit of electrocardiogram action happening in the S&Ps. Now, hopefully, I know I just said the word hope, but hopefully, let's throw in a 50-day simple moving average and go to the weekly chart. Let's take a look at the weekly real quick. I've done a lot of presentations on this recently. Now, we had one little kiss of that weekly right here, moving average. But so far, as far as the moving average is concerned, and Dave Light being that lows are greater than moving average, this market is hanging in there. Now, those of you who've been following me for a couple of years know that I was pretty much bearish in 15 Late 15 and early 16, I just was not too excited about the markets. In addition to weekly bow tie sell signals, we also had Dave Light below the 50-week moving average, which had me a little bit concerned. Now, we did come down and tag the 50-day moving average. Maybe this is just going to kiss that moving average goodbye. And so far, so good. You know the routine, folks. One day at a time. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ looks a little bit better, a little bit better for two reasons. One, it actually never did make it all the way down to its 200-day moving average. In other words, there's still daylight above. And number two, and more importantly, it's not too far away from all-time highs, okay? I guess it'd be a little bit higher. It'd be right there. It would be all-time highs. But you're only a couple hundred points away, so that's certainly a good thing. Now... I'm not going to get too excited about the market until and unless it can get to new highs and stay there. Why? Well, we still have these sideways arrows working here. Yes, longer term, you can make the case that the big blue arrow still points sideways. But over the immediate term, we're just about where we were when? Way back in December. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty is right here on the cusp of making all-time highs. Now, should we pop the champagne corks? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly encouraged by the fact that by the end of the day, we could close at all-time highs, and that would be excellent, okay? And I won't have to short any more stocks for this year. That'd be fantastic. But again, let's not start kissing each other just yet until and unless it goes on to make new highs and then more importantly, stays there. Okay, as usual, as I preach, follow through will be key. Now, in the sectors, energies are now breaking out. You go back a week or so ago and I was like, well, for me to get excited about energies, they'd have to break out the new highs and what and stay there. Well, they break out the new highs. Step one. Some areas are looking questionable still. Consumer non-durables, not so hot. Foods and beverage, not so hot. These are so-called defensive areas. I've been a little concerned about that. Drugs, up until last week or so, were looking pretty dismal too. The defense stocks, and I've been a little concerned about this, they were outperforming the market on a relative basis, but then they began to break down. And they still look questionable at best. A lot of other areas especially on a net-net basis, have headed lower as of late manufacturing. Semiconductors are coming back nicely, but still, if you do your net-net tests, they're still headed lower on a net-net basis, at least. A couple of areas, though, like hardware, not too far from brand-new highs. 
And if you have hardware, you got to have software for your hardware. Anybody know what that reference is? No, I didn't watch the whole movie. I don't think anybody on this planet actually did. That was one of the songs. Hardware, you got to have software for your hardware. I'm going to Google that afterwards. <laughs> Waste of time. But look at the software. Bam. I sound like an old person. Look at the so look at the software. It's uh, at a, uh, what do you call that thing? An article. Add an article to everything. Look at that. Brand new highs. So that's certainly a good thing. A couple more things here. One, bonds. Bonds are kind of hanging in there, not too far from these multi-year lows. As long as these multi-year lows hold, I'm not going to get too excited about bonds. But very important that they hold. Otherwise, bonds down, rates up. Could put a little pressure on stocks. Unless, of course, stocks keep going higher and people feel like they must be in stocks. That so-called FOMO, fear of missing out. Well, I need to beat the dead horse here on something, by the way. I wasn't going to talk about it, but I just I changed my mind. Judd Dotery, as Greg pointed out in Investing with the Trends, said that anybody who has kept pace with the market, he's talking about professional money managers, since 2009 should be questioned because they did not and will likely not in the future take evasive actions when, not if, bad conditions come along. Now, every time this market has turned south, what has it done? It's turned right back up. Including maybe, maybe, hopefully, this time. Well, that'll work until it don't, okay? It don't right here, right? Down 50%. Another one of these, it don't right here, down 50%, okay? NASDAQ Composite down 77% in 2000. So it doesn't always go up longer term. Again, watch those first four videos. From Trading Full Circle. I know you people know this, but I am caught up in so many GD arguments about the market goes up longer term. No, it doesn't. Okay. As I said, and I think Greg later said, if you're retiring, you retire right here. Bam. Winning. Okay. Let's say you don't pull your money out the market. And Greg's example was a million dollars, which I thought was a good example. You got a million dollars here. You're okay. Better than the poke in the eye, right? And you're retired. But if this thing drops down to here, if you got ten million dollars, you lose five. Eh, million here, million there. Who cares? You lose half your money. You still got five million bucks. But if this thing drops to here and you're down fifty percent and you're forced to cash out, you should have cashed out a long time ago anyway. Then your lifestyle down here is a lot different than your lifestyle up here. I'm sorry, I just stepped on my. Uh, I just got on my horse. My brother-in-law makes fun of me because I say harsh. That's my coon ass jumping out. Okay. Question is J-R-S-H. Okay. When I'm looking at an IPO, I do have patterns that will get you along one, two, three, four, five at the close of day five. There's a lot of caveats involved. I'm not going to go through all of those today. I covered it in detail in the IPO course. And by the way, when I launch a learning management system, I'm going to put the first four videos in the IPO course, and that's going to really get you up to speed. Again, it's another one of those, hey, it's going to be free, or at least that part, provided you're a member. But I'm also going to give you some useful information on how to view and think and trade IPOs. The other thing that I would do with this one is, and this is on my website for free, is I'd put in a five-day moving average, which it's not going to show up until tomorrow. And I would look at that little Dave light system, which is simply you wait for the low to be above the moving average and close at a new high. And that's the whole system. Now, do I like this stock? Yes, I do. Because it could close at a new high. So, yes, I think it's worth a shot. Donald, good eye on that one. High five. Hey, first stock of the day, first high five of the day. First high five in a while. Awesome. Okay, NVIDIA. The problem with NVIDIA is it's electrocardiogram in more recent times. Longer term, I think it was the Bitcoin. Bitcoin pushed that thing higher. They found out, I don't know if you guys, you guys who are in the technology know this, but 
they found out that the mining computers, if you use the graphic part of the computer, it worked a lot better at those type of computations. Somebody figured that out. And you'll see uh, Google Bitcoin miners and, and go on eBay and look for Bitcoin mining machines or whatever. And it's basically a power supply and a graphic card. I guess there's a few more bits and pieces. Anyway, that's probably the excitement of the NVIDIA, which actually drove graphic cards through the roof. I was looking at a dual processor card a while back and was like, good Lord. Anyway, before I digress too far, I know too late. Yeah, it's broken out to new highs, but what type of trader am I? Well, I like to trade pullbacks and not breakouts. So if it could follow through, maybe on a pullback. My only concern here, and this is a little bit kind of perverse if you think about it in the thinking of it, is when the market turns around after a correction like we just had, and let's say the NASDAQ goes on to make new highs and the S&P 500 goes on to make new highs. Now, I haven't quantified this. Maybe the market has to go down significantly for this to work. But one thing that I've noticed is stocks that had been doing really well on a relative basis longer term tend to underperform a little bit. And reason is those stocks become a source of funds and the, the managers, the money managers go in and they sell those stocks to raise money to buy stocks at lower levels. So that's one of the kind of counterintuitive things like, but Dave, I thought you preach print, trend, trend, trend. Well, I do. But in these particular cases, what happens is they become a source of funds. So that's my only concern there. Not that I wouldn't trade it if it's set up, but so far it's not set up. It's a long-winded answer. Sorry about that. From bars, XP, XPSL. Symbol not found. You got another one? You got a, a good symbol, XPSL. It's either not, it's not in my system, so. There's not enough time to fire up a second feed. Is that right, Donald? Check that check that symbol. Baba for my for Dave. Baba. Alibaba. Well, this is a big fix stock. It's electric cardigram, okay? Or Jack Mason stock. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Or Katy Perry stock. It's up, then it's down, it's up, and it's black and it's white. It's what else you saying? Hot and cold. Um so what you have to do is wait for it to break out the new highs and then look at trade pullbacks. Okay. XSPL. All right, let's try that. X, XSPL. Oh, another one of those IPOs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good range. Yeah, I'll get, yeah, absolutely. You have the IPO course. You're a uh, very nice work. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's put that moving average in there, a little five-day moving average. And nope, it won't. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I guess it won't plot until day six. That's interesting. One, two, three, four. Yeah, but if it closes up here, I think it would be. Oh, there it is. It would be a buy. Oh, that's a one bar. Five. Close. Nope, I won't plot it. I got to work on that. Yeah, I like it. I do like it. Uh, looks like it's got okay volume today. Yeah, that's two. You're two for two there, Donald. Good job. LGCY. LGCY. The question is is it a pullback or is it a TKO? On a pullback of TKO. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe. What I would do in the energies right now, it's still at relatively low levels longer term. you got some bad memories back here, but so what? That's a long ways away. Yeah, on a pullback, sure. On a TKO, absolutely. I would also encourage you in the energies to go in and try to find some stocks that are just turning the corner, just waking up. Okay? VST. VST. For my friends of the show. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, boy, you guys are getting better. 
it needs a little bit more pullback. Also, the only thing that kind of concerns me is that it really didn't it really didn't take off with a whole lot of vigor, but it looks okay. Let's take a look at it when it pulls back a little bit. Again, another energy stock. Let's try to find some energies at low levels. I'm running late today, so I can't do it for you, but take a look at some energies at a little bit lower levels. This looks a little interesting and also looks a little dangerous because the HV is 102. Let's back the chart out. It's kind of crazy longer term. You had this big, huge gap. I know that was a few years ago, but you don't know what happened here. Is there still a lot of bad memories in this stock? I guess it's far enough back in time to not go crazy worrying about it, but it's going to be a very speculative stock. It's going to need a little bit more knockout move for me to get excited. And the reason is this stock ran up, what's that, 100%, 200% over a short period of time. It's just way crazy, way dangerous, speculative. I mean, if you buy it, use a three-point stop, okay? It's kind of a joke. LMT, short, absolutely. LMT is on my lander list for today. I shouldn't be talking about it, but yeah. These defense stocks are in trouble so far, at least. Of course, things are heating up in the world. Maybe they'll be better later. But yeah, it's broken down. It's pulled back. It's probably going to be a uh, bow tie. Not quite kind of a sloppy bow tie. But yeah, thrust down, pull back, overhead supply. High five. Good job on that one. Yes, You're, everybody's naming all the other ones in the Landry list that are defense stocks. Yes, 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 yes. I'm not going to bring them up out of courtesy to my people. I publish a list every day. Docu. Well, these IPOs at higher levels, and if you watch those first few videos, I think I talked about it there. If not, I'll throw it out to you. I tend to like IPOs, at least at this point in time, and going back two or three years ago, whenever I first did that IPO course, I like IT, IPOs for on the what I call the pioneer signals, the early signals, something like this within the first few weeks of trading. I like them when they're at lower a lower price. So below 20 was my cutoff then, and that number might change a little bit. So let's say they've been public for a while. I imagine that's a long, long time. Then what I would do is look for a secondary signal. So on something like this, I wouldn't buy on something like this would actually be a buy here based on certain things that I follow. And then over here, this might be a good example to show you of the Dave Light system. So according to Dave Light, it would have been a buy. Oops, I keep screwing that up. According to Dave Light, it would have been buy actually on this day here, and that's a pioneer signal. Now, since it's higher price like this, I would prefer to see how it performs longer term and then play that first pullback as opposed to playing the pioneer signal. Those other ones we looked at a few minutes ago looked pretty good because they were lower price and they had nice range and all. How much of portfolio we'd risk in a single sector? Uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, two positions, two full positions. So 4% if stopped out. Now, I guess you could look at the margin and, and make some other calculations based on that. But we're trading fairly volatile stocks, so they'll probably the margin will probably be roughly, um, roughly the same on both positions. So two positions, and as I often say, let's say you have on – Two positions, so you're going to lose 4% if you're stopped out. So you've got 4% at risk of your portfolio, and technically a little bit more, obviously, barring overnight gaps, uh, you only have 4%. But the good thing is, let's say that one stock hits the initial profit target, then what's going to happen is you now have 1% if stopped out in that. So... I can make this thing work. So let's say you put 2% in XYZ, which is a semiconductor. And then you put 2% if stopped out in ABC. 
Well, if this one rallies up, it hits the initial profit target, you now have 1% in it because you sold half. And if this one rallies up, it hits the initial profit target, you now have 1% in it. So now you have room for one more position in that sector. So it's not necessarily the number of positions in the sector. It's a number of risk that your initial risk, if stopped out. And then I guess you could argue that, well, if you, you've been stopped out, then you, your risk is, is break even on those, but your exposure is still kind of dangerous. So I kind of look at it, but I kind of rewind it back to the initial exposure of 2%, 2%, and then keep that number under four. So two brand new positions, and it could be up to three or four positions if it all works out swimmingly. You just keep adding on positions within that sector. All right, a couple of more, and we're, boy, I'm way over time. Chief Orman really wound up today. BTE, BTE. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Uh, it needs a little bit of a pullback. It had a little bit of a knockout here. It wasn't quite enough. I do like the fact that it's very persistent. I'm just kind of, and this is why I like to teach FYI. It looks like, Something as simple as a five-day moving average could really help you gauge your persistency. Notice that that five-day moving average here, by accident, I have it plotted, follows along very nicely. A lot of bar intersection and lots of daylight along with that. And that, in and of itself, would probably be a pretty good gauge of persistency. Write that down. I think I just learned something here. But, yeah, it needs more of a knockout move to it for me to go after it. Is IART a TKO? IART. Um, sort of. Sort of. Let me uh, back the chart out a little bit. Let me clean up the, the chart. I said sort of because the chart wasn't printed yet. Let's take a look at that. Uh, well, I don't know about this big gap down here. That's got me a little suspect of this. Anybody know what happened here? Integral Life Sciences. They might have killed somebody or something, huh? Well, let's just look at it in and of itself. Well, the problem is it didn't really have that big of a run. Okay, a TKO, going back to that example we had earlier, I'll just draw it for you. It should have a, like a long run and then the TKO move as opposed to such a short run in here. Okay, the run from there to there. So I would pass on that one, but I hear what you're saying, that big opening gap reversal, knockout type of move. I mean, yes, it's a knockout type of move, but I wouldn't take it because it's not in a longer term trend. Two for one split? I don't think so. Tools show unadjusted. Oh, sorry. I hope that didn't screw things up. All right. How did that get in here? All right, much better. Much better. All right, now let's take a look at it. Yeah, even though even though I had that confusion about the split, I hope that didn't screw us up too much in a chart show. But notice that it really didn't take off that far. And then the scab came all the way back down to its base. So I'd pass on that. Good day for stock picks. Yeah, finally, you know, we had uh, so many for so long. Well, look, I'm out of time. I'm way out of time. I apologize to those who didn't get to your stock picks. Any unanswered questions, shoot me an email, davidavelander.com. If I can't get right back to you, which lately it has been tough because I'm spending so much of my time on this learning management system and also dealing with some family issues, as many of you know, um, we will, or I will make it fodder for an upcoming show. So feel free to shoot me an email and I'll let you know if it's an answer that requires a lot of thought. The good news is eventually I should be able to point you to exact lessons on all this. That should, uh, again, I'm such a nerd. I'm excited about this LMS system. Anyway, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much for coming today. Appreciate it.